Going to move on to my next then. Uh, so, my next is our adventures with IPv6 first hop security in our cloud environment. Um, so, there is some duplication in what I'm going to talk about between some of the talks that we've had here regarding security on the LAN. Um, I personally see that as a good thing because it, um, it, it really brings the message home. But I'm going to talk about how we've used some of these things um, in, in providing a v6 cloud environment and what the security means to us. I need to start with some background though and, and talk to you about what our environment actually is. So in 2011, um, we launched a, a, a uniform cloud computing product. I say uniform because before that, we had many offerings that were based on virtualization and you could have called cloud, but 2001, 2011, we launched a real cloud computing product and, and we became known for it in the industry and we called it VDC or Virtual Data Center. Um, and at the time, um, customers traditionally hosted services on, on their own hardware, that either in their premises or in our data centers. And customers, when they bought hardware, they were usually enterprise names and brands, so, so big things, HP, Dell, IBM, so on and so forth. Um, and, but we were trying to build trust in a, in a new market. Um, and this meant that if we were going to do something like that, we would probably have to use big brand equipment as well, and we did. Um, and I say here the flesh was willing but the spirit was weak and what I mean by that is there was basically no decent software that was available at the time. There were lots of big vendors that had ideas but no real solutions to the problems and eventually we found a supplier that we worked with to, um, for this software but the networking part of it we largely had to do it ourselves because pretty much nobody understood how to make some of this stuff work. So let me talk to you about the networking model then. So. I have all these acronyms on this page, but I'll, I'll try and sort of simplify it. Um, the, the provisioning workflow for a virtual machine is that you pick a flavor of, of VM and configuration. You say, like, I want a Windows box or I want a Linux box of this kind. Um, and you add some networking to it. You say that this VM should have these NICs on it. Um, and the NICs have got three flavors associated with them. Um, Pub, we call them public, they're called publicly public, external, and private. But um, internally, we call the first two of those SIA. And, and DIA, and what does that actually mean? So if you think of public or, or SIA as a, as a shared network that people can join, um, it's actually a shared network that they can get an address on very easily, but in return for it being a shared network, we have to put lots and lots of security on it um, to make it not like a shared network, if you know what I mean. So rather than, rather than we're trading sort of security complex, routing complexity and switching complexity for security complexity. Um, and the other type of network you should know about is external, we call DIA, and that's where you get a dedicated network, your own address space, you can do what you want with. Um, and DIA is really a partitioned network, piece of network resource, like a broadcast domain or a VLAN or whatever it is these days, and it's dedicated to customers. But SIA is a shared network, shared routing domain. Um, and, and traditionally, the machines that have to request, in, especially in the SIA, they have to request addresses via long-lived DHCP leases. Um, that's mandatory in the SIA. You, you can do it in, in dedicated networks in the, in the DIA, but you don't have to. Um, and we have a custom DHCP server that we wrote that serves state from the cloud provisioning database, so we don't have leases. Everything is stateless from the perspective of the DHCP server, but it's stateful from the perspective of the platform. So what is SIA? Well, it lets you get an address quickly. You have a big pool of addresses. This where you are, you pick the location for your machine. You say, I want an address quickly. It says, pick an address from a long list of addresses. You pick it from a pool, and your VM can have a public address that's directly attached if you want. And there's no NAT, well, unless your VM is a NAT box. It's, you have this NIC, and it's directly attached to your VM. But the SIA is a shared domain. It's a shared routing domain. Uh, and a shared broadcast domain. We don't segment customers from each other any more than we would filter them from each other if they were in dedicated routing domains. So for example, I wouldn't filter one customer from another, regardless of, uh, uh, layer three at least, regardless of where they are on the network because customers legitimately need to communicate with each other because this thing in the middle on public addressing is supposedly the internet, which is, you know, should have end to end. So we don't do that. Um, but we do have a first hop security, mo security model. Um, and the flows that don't meet the criteria for that model are dropped. So let's look at, I can't, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this because obviously some of it is, is, is sort of confidential and proprietary, but largely in the V4 model, we'll do things like filter ether types, filter source max, filter destination max, um, 
make sure that the only DHCPv4 servers are, are, are our authorized, in the SIA this is, are our authorized ones that provide the platform state, will only permit ARP replies that come from your DHCP assigned address and will only permit source addresses that you've been assigned by the DHCP server. Um, and how's that really implemented? Well, remember what I said about, about building this all on enterprise grade hardware. You know, we paid a vendor and they have a bunch of features and and some of these features we have to do ourselves and some of these features you know they, they kind of provide for us but d they don't tend to work from day one but maybe on day 604 they're, they're sort of a bit more mature and they do work um, so there are vendor features that correspond to all of these things that um, in v4 terms the vendor feature is you am sure you can guess by now if you google for these terms that cisco things dhcp snooping authorized arp and ip source guard that's the v4 security model so look at the v6 implementation which is kind of the same concept there's a shared broadcast domain um, but if you consider the sio 64 with a stateful dhcp v6 service and delegation then you've got a threat model that's pretty well defined and that threat model is really largely attacks on neighbor discovery which is a control plane attack creation of unauthorized neighborships poisoning of neighbor caches Exhaustion of neighbor caches, so rate exhaustion, queue exhaustion, um, volumetric exhaustion. Attacks on RA, which is another control plane attack. Unauthorized RAs, misleading RAs, poisoning and so forth. Um, and then we've got obviously the forwarding implications of this, which is packets being forwarded from unauthorized source addresses and prefixes. And I'll talk about, about destinations as well. So we start with the stateful DHCP v6. So um, host uh, in the SIA gets an RA um, with the managed flag set um, and uh, it does appear on link to everybody. Um, it's not really on link, um, but it, it appears to be on link to the host. Actually, we do some proprietary thing where we pick the frames out and forward them to something and send them back without invoking a stateful DHCP proxy and not having to overcome any of the challenges talked about in RFC 6939 about relaying attributes and such. But yes, it appears that it's on link. Um, set the M flag, point it at the, uh, from the RA, we set the M flag, point at the DHCP server. Um, the lease reflects the provisioned address they've selected in the SIA. Um, and if they've got a, a, a prefix associated with them, we'll then delegate that prefix, say if the host is going to be a router or, or whatever they're going to do with it. Um, so, well then, the record of this address and delegation is added to a database, a bindings database, and the vendor, this function's called Glean, it learns about this from the inspecting the, it's got, actually the feature lets you inspect ND and it lets you inspect the HTTPv6, but obviously we have it to set to only inspect the HTTPv6. Um, so the binding DB is populated by what's in effect the contents of the DHCPv6 stateful database. Um, and uh, we obviously prevent any rogue DHCPv6 service, so we use DHCPv6 guard. Um, and just like its v4 counterpart, it blocks unauthorized DHCPv6 supplies. And we know this is susceptible to the evasion scenarios talked about earlier. So we need additional mitigation for that. And without going into too much detail, that's a combination of filtering um, particular header sizes and destination multicast max and all of the things that don't allow you to properly use extension headers in the environment, but just enough for the customers to function. And that seems to work. Um, so in the neighbor discovery uh, and, and RA phase, the bindings are used to validate any uh, further ND. And the vendor calls that ND inspection, um, and, and that's effectively savvy. Um, invalid ND packets are dropped before we do anything else. So any, any ND packets that are malformed or, 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 or you know, don't meet strict criteria are just thrown away. Um, and then assertions are validated against the bindings database. And we'll validate the neighbor address, the bound MAC, source MAC, and that will mitigate against spoofing and poisoning. Now, this, this, takes you in, this can create some awkward situations where um, a host comes up and then, but can't be validated and can't speak until it can be validated. And there's a, there's a bootstrapping problem in here. Um, and, and the solution to that is actually really complicated and it involves pre-warming some of the ND inspection cache, but it's generally like that. Um, and the router reversements are also validated, um, and that's RA guard. Um, we'll block RAs from unauthorized sources. We'll do the same thing for avoiding evasion where the, you have these, m this multitude of, of different header lengths and extension headers. We'll also limit the rate limit the ND. 
so that, that they have two features, ND cache interface limit and ND resolution rate limit, um, one of which is the cache size um, uh, and, and the queue size, and the other is, is the rate at which NDs will be performed. And we'll validate the source and the destination. So uh, we'll validate the source of the packets in forwarding against the bindings DB, um, and that's IPv6 source guard and IPv6 prefix guard. Um, link locals allowed, but the global auto-configured addresses are not. Um, uh, and URPF is also put upstream as it always is to make sure that nothing else gets out that shouldn't. Um, and we'll validate the global destinations against the bindings DB as well, and that's IPv6 destination guard. So that mitigates against uh, uh, you know, spraying all of these destinations and then forcing them to be gleaned and bringing us back into this process of trying to work out where they are. Um, so generally this approach, of lo well, lots and lots of problems with this approach, but basically the features didn't work and hadn't worked for a very, very long time um, and practically didn't have a working platform for three, four years, I must say, on, on a number of counts. Memory leaks, lots and lots of memory leaks. Anything involving memory, which is practically everything, you can imagine that you're not going to get any of it back. Um, <laughs> overzealous defaults. Um, so rate limits that are programmed into, I, into the software that change between versions of the software depending on how people feel that something should be implemented. That's been a bit of a problem, especially with the ND rate limits. Um, another problem that we've had is, is the ND bindings database. So the vendor has no implementation of um, being able to synchronize binding between different switches. So if you can imagine that you've got a, a switch fabric that, that might, you know, you might use some kind of uh, underlay to move packets or put something on top of that, an overlay network to carry traffic, um, and there's the potential for traffic to move around different things in the switching domain. The binding database is only populated from the contents of the glean and anything else we put in it. So we had to come up with a solution for extracting the, re regularly extracting the contents of all of the distributed binding database and merging them together and shoveling them out to all the other switches. And the vendor said, oh, why would you do that? Said, because it breaks if you don't do that. And, and customers, so when we have a, a change of, of traffic path or forwarding state, you know, no customers function anymore because the switch didn't learn about them and now they're talking and they can't learn about them, this kind of thing. Um, and, and emergencies, so in a lot of cases, and we had this a lot with the V4, when things would break, it didn't work, or there was corruption of state, you had to do something about it. Customers would call in, nothing's working. Why is nothing working? The bindings database is corrupt, or the bindings database has been lost, or the bindings database hasn't synchronized. So we had these series of scripts that would grant amnesties to customers in the early days so that um, you could troubleshoot a problem with, with one of these features. Um, so yeah, it's been relatively painful. Was it all worth it? So they're mostly vendor features and, and a lot of which now are actually standardized, but most of them didn't appear in mature code until recently. These are really recent inventions and things that we've grown up with. Um, the alternative that we have was to try and forward traffic through the hypervisor or through some kind of routing entity there, which is, which is largely akin to what's done in a number of the public cloud providers. Um, and not having a shared broadcast domain, but that you know, was itself a development, uh, uh, a lot of development involved in that, um, especially to support the forwarding security. Another alternative we toyed with is just not offering SI and, and, giving, and saying to customers, like, like you can do in AWS, here's a prefix, you go carve it up how you want, you've got your own uh, domain. And, and you know, that, that is something that we seriously discussed. But the point is that it, this was designed with usability in mind um, and customers had to be able to easily get an address without having to, the, I think the objective was to get an address without having to think about an addressing plan because these people were server operators, not necessarily network operators, let alone with the experience of IPv6. So, questions? Adrian. Uh, do you have many of your customers that... It's an awful lot of work you've done, obviously. Do you have many of your actual customers hosted there that are sourcing these attacks that make it all worthwhile in the first place, not just the kind of political threat of, we'll turn your service off? Sourcing attacks? You mean at, at, at first hop, or you mean uh, from my previous presentation about... Uh, uh, the you're referring to the the presentation you've just finished? They're the just in the first top. No, not really. We sometimes have people that, that will start a machine up um, and it has a default implementation that does something funny on the network and it will get, it'll either get its traffic filtered or it gets port shut down. 
but that, that's more in V4 than it is in V6. I haven't really seen that so much in V6. One of the problems we, we ha early problems we had when trialling the V6 on the SIA service was that um, a lot of operating systems didn't come with the DHCP V6 client. And we'd built a DHCP V6 service and that was a problem, but now, you know, it used to be that there was a transitionary stage where you had to add, you, you had to build, you had to roll the images so that the DHCP V6 client started first so that it could receive a stateful address but now this is not a problem so in terms of sourcing things that they shouldn't don't really see it but then again um, if they do most of the time the, the traffic's either filtered or the ports shut down and I couldn't tell you about specific incidences